my Korean friend once posted an article from The Onion. The Onion, in case you didn't know, is a satirical newspaper. The news stories are fictional, and they're funny, but they're also true, or rather they convey a certain kind of truth, even though the story's made up. So let me tell you about this one Onion article she posted. It's about this Asian American, and he has this white friend, and this white friend says to the Asian American, I notice on your social media account you have all these Asian friends that I don't know. And it looks like you're having a lot of fun. We should all hang out together. And so the Asian American guy says, yeah, sure, uh, yeah, let's do that. And that was a while ago, and the white guy's still waiting to get invited to hang out with the Asian people. That's the end of the article. I thought it was kind of funny. The point is that Asian Americans, you know, like I got my white friends, and I really like them. And I got my Asian friends, and I also really like them. The thing is, the weird thing is, I don't really want to mix the two groups up together. So my Korean American friends asked a bunch of us Asian Americans, is, is this true? Do you, do you do this? And we hadn't really thought about it until we read the article. And we all responded something like, yeah, we got our racially segregated friend groups. And it was funny because we all do that, and none of us really know why we do it. And it was never intentional, it just sort of happens to all of us, and we realize that once we start thinking about it. I bring this up because as Korean American Christians, we got our white friends, and we got our Korean friends. And that thing makes our dynamic a bit more complicated. It's because all our Korean friends, we met, all our Korean Amer we met them in Korean American churches. And all our white friends, we met them outside of the church. And so what that means is we tend to think of our Korean friends as church people, or we know them in a church context. And we tend to think of our white friends as not Christian, or we know them in a not Christian context, even if they are Christian. Look, I know this is a massive and sweeping overgeneralization. There are tons of exceptions. I'm just describing some tendencies that may or may not be true, but I think they, they're kind of true for a lot of us. But if we associate God and the Christian faith with Korean culture and non-Christianity with the white American culture, that has some interesting and unintended consequences. So these are just some speculations. They may or may not be true, and even if they are true, they may not even apply to you. But I like to think through this. So as I said in my previous videos, there is this honor and shame thing in our Korean culture. And I'm suggesting that that system of thought affects the way Korean Americans think about our Christian faith. As I said before, honor and shame is performative. Honor needs to be seen, or it's on honor. And I'm wondering sometimes if the Korean church becomes the place where we perform Christianity. It becomes a place where we act Christian and do Christian things for other Korean Christians to see. I mean, it's good to serve God. It's good to serve the community. But perhaps we need to take pause every now and then and think about our motives. Would we do what we do if no one saw us do it? Or do what we do what we do as Christians in a church context in order to be seen doing it and in some sense get credit for it? And do we do, we do those things that are honorable? Likewise, shame is only shame if we are seen or get caught. Okay, so part of what we do as a Christian community is that we acknowledge our weakness and we confess our sins to one another. Now, clearly how we do this takes judgment and wisdom and maturity. We do not need to tell everyone everything we've done all the time. But we do need to have an attitude of humility towards one another and think of one another as better than ourselves. I've heard it said recently that the un only unforgivable sin is self-righteousness to believe that you're good on your own and you're better than those around you. And I think that's right. But the shame thing, that would require that I hide my failures, my weaknesses, my vulnerabilities from the community. Hmm. And that, 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 that sort of seems to work against Christianity and shame. And a relationship with God. We are supposed to God, go to God naked, vulnerable, with no pretense. We go to God with all our fears or anxieties, failures and needs. And we need to confess our sins to God with no equivocation. But if shame and honor train us to hide our failures and put on our best public performance, do we act that way in front of God, even when we're alone in front of God? Let me end with one more idea. Honor is precarious. It's fragile. You're always just one screw up away from losing your honor and slipping backwards into shame. 
And if you do fall into shame, you owe it to yourself and your family and all your dead Korean ancestors, all 5,000 years of them, to crawl up that steep mountain and regain your honor. But the cross is shame. Christ was nailed to the cross, naked for all the world to see, stripped of all dignity and honor. Now, are you anxious that you might be shamed? Christ took all our shame. He took all our shame upon himself. And all that honor that we're trying to get, that we strive so hard to achieve, Christ gives you his honor. You could not lose that honor if you tried. And all the work you're doing to cover up your shame, you can't cover it enough. Christ has done it. And all that work you're trying to do to gain that honor for yourself and those around you that you love, that's in all the work you could do can't compare with the honor that God is already giving you. This honor and shame thing that we got going on as Korean Americans, it's not a hindrance for us to understand the gospel. It actually may help us understand it better.